out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, your long-suffering. Lord, we pray that you would bless God the teaching of the children in the back in the study of your word in here tonight. We pray, Lord, that your spirit and your word would move and minister with free course. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We'll be reading a little bit more as we go along, but I want to talk about Abraham tonight. Everything that we talk about, really, in the New Testament, uh, when we look at our covenant of grace, when we look at the goodness of God and the things that we experience, it all started with one man's covenant with the Lord. God spoke to Abraham, and he said, if you will go. I will bless you. If you will go to a land that I will show you. We see Abraham's faith here in that he did not have all of the details. There are some of us that we want all of our questions answered. If we're told to do something, we want to know who, what, when, where, how, and why. Why do I have to do it? Why do I have to do it that way? How long do I have to do it? What's the purpose behind it? What is the benefit of me? But God spoke to Abraham a simple command. He said, if you will go, I will bless you. And he said, if you will go to a land that I will show thee. He didn't say what land he was going. He just said, if you're willing to go, if you'll pack up and leave your country, leave your family, and follow my word, I will bless you. We have got to be willing to follow God's word. I don't always understand everything in life. I don't always know what, how it's going to play out tomorrow. But one thing I have decided is that I have got to follow God's word. Right. My obedience cannot be based on circumstance. My obedience in, in God's word cannot be based on what is going on around me, on situations that I'm facing, on how I feel. But I have got to trust the Lord. He said, if you will go, I will make of thee a great nation. Now, I want you to understand that Abram's name here was still Abram. God had not given him any children yet. Abraham and Sarah had not conceived Isaac. He had not even conceived Ishmael yet. But the Lord said, out of you, I will make a great nation. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, we have a God who calls those things that are not yet as though they already were. What does that mean? God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a great nation. I'm going to make you the father of many nations before he had any children. God was calling him a father before he had a child. We need to learn that God does not look at our present circumstance to determine what he wants to do in our life. I'll never forget, Bradley was probably just, just a baby if he was even born yet. I was working in South Bend and I've shared this with you before, so I won't give you all the details, but I was at a time in my life where I was questioning my calling and my ministry and what I was going to do with the Lord and, and for the Lord, and, and I was working in South Bend, and I had an hour and 20 minute drive to work one way, and I was just very discouraged as I was praying and talking to the Lord in the privacy of my car, and, and just, you know, this is back when cell phones, you paid by the minute, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I didn't just talk to anybody. Uh, but I, I was just praying and talking to the Lord and just pouring my heart out to God. I had a job that I loved. I was running a Christian bookstore in South Bend. I loved it. I got to take pastors out to lunch. I got to minister to people, pray with people. I was selling Bibles and all kinds of books and learning. And just, it was great. I loved it. And I would not have been disappointed if I would have stayed there. 
But I remember feeling very discouraged. Not very many people were acknowledging my calling yet. And, and uh, you know, kind of lived in a, in, in a church that um, family members got promoted. But if you weren't family, you kind of got overlooked. We got to be careful that we don't turn the church into a hierarchy. Not everybody uh, is going to be a pastor just because their dad is a pastor. Not everybody's going to step into ministry just because their family did. Now, it happens many times that way, but that's not always the case. And so I was, I was growing very discouraged. I remember praying. I said, God, maybe this is all that I've got. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I'm not called to be a pastor. Maybe the extent of my ministry is to work at this bookstore and and minister to the people that come in and pray with them and sell Bibles, and, and it's not a bad thing. I like it. I'm not unhappy. Maybe this is it. And I'll never forget, I got to the bookstore that day, and a gentleman came in, and, and I'm running through the details, but a gentleman I've never spoke to before, and we were speaking, and he stopped me, and he said, are you a pastor? And I said, no. And he looked at me, and he said, yes, you are. He said, you may not be pastoring yet, but you are a pastor. Yeah, that's there was a principle there. God calls those things that are not yet as though they already were. This man in the spirit saw the call of God in my life. And what he was trying to tell me is you've got to recognize your identity. You may not be doing it yet, but that's who you are. God said to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. He didn't even have one kid yet. You've got to have a lot of kids if you're going to have a nation. Yeah. I know some families, it seems like they're trying to start their own baseball team every time they turn around and having kids. But there's a big stretch from starting a baseball team to having a nation. Right. And he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, not just a small nation, but a great nation. But it was all contingent on whether Abraham could have faith in God's word. I don't see anywhere in the scripture where God spoke to Abraham before this time. I don't see it. They, they didn't have daily conversations where the Lord said, I'm just going to sit down and talk to Abraham. Let's have a cup of coffee. Let's, let's talk about the future here. But God said to Abraham, if you'll trust me, if you'll go. And Abraham, we know that he trusted God. In verse 4 of Genesis chapter 12, it says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed. How many is ready to start a new life at 75? Some of us are at the age where we are now. We're thinking, I don't want to start over. Amen. I, I don't want to start over. I don't want to get a new job. I don't want to move to a new city. And I certainly don't want to start over raising children. But at 75 years old, and I know they live longer than then, but at 75 years old, Abraham said, I'm going to go. And so he went and he took his wife Sarah with him. Women, you got to trust your husband. Yeah. All right. God did not send an angel to talk to Sarah. Right. He talked to Abraham. God spoke to Abraham. He didn't speak to Sarah. But Abraham had such a walk with God and such character and integrity, and he had led his family well, so that when Abraham comes home and says, Hi, Sarah, how are you doing? What's for dinner? By the way, I heard this voice. And we need to pack up and go. Oh, really? Where are we going? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but we just need to pack up and we'll find out when we get there. Sarah had enough confidence in Abraham that she said, okay, let's go. I wonder how many of us as men, I'm talking to the men for a minute, I wonder how many of us have displayed wisdom and integrity and the ability to hear from God that if we went to our wife and said, I heard this voice, and we got to go, that our wife would look at us and say, honey, did you hit your head? Are you sick? You got a fever? But Abraham had such integrity in his life, such consistency, that Sarah said, okay, let's go. And even the family that was around him and, and his nephew Lot that he had raised, they all followed Abraham. 
all the souls that he had gotten at Haran. They went forth into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. They followed him because Abraham had integrity in his word. If we want influence, we have to have integrity. If we want our children to follow after God, they need to see consistency in us. Sometimes we wonder, why aren't my kids living for God? Well, it's because they see our life. We cannot live one way in church on Sunday and Wednesday and then live a different way every other day of the week and expect our kids to put any faith in our walk with God. Mm -hmm. I've had people ask me, you know, in the past as a pastor, Pastor, what did I do wrong? Why aren't my children living for God? Why are my children backslid? Why are my children in this mess? Well, dear sweet church member and saint of God, are you consistent? Are you showing them how to live for God? Are you teaching them how to pray and fast and worship and make the house of the Lord a priority? Or are you coming in and, and running the aisles and then going out and not giving God another thought? We can fool a lot of people, but it's hard to fool our family. Right. Uh -huh. Sister Robin, you can be sweet when you come to church, but Paul knows the real story. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we can't fool our family. I'm reminded of a lady that we all used to call Grandma Halsey growing up, and her husband was a worshiper, Brother Albert Halsey. He would he never was a preacher, but he would back when we had Sunday school superintendents. Some of the old timers will remember what Sunday school superintendents are. Brother Albert was a Sunday school superintendent, but he could get the congregation fired up. And in his elder age, the Holy Ghost would hit him, and he would run the back of the pews. My wife's back there shaking her head. Yeah. He would run, not just walk, right. but I'm talking hit the pews and run the backs of the pews and shout unto God. But his wife told him one time at home, she's an old southern woman, and she just told me how it was, and I, I saw her do it many times. But she said to him, don't you dare be a hypocrite. She said, if you get up and run those pews and you go home, I'll kick you in the shins. She said, don't you be a hypocrite. Our families know, and so we have to have integrity in how we live. Abraham had displayed that faithfulness. He had displayed that integrity that all they went on was a word and his character. How many people would follow us if it was just on a word and our character? I want to live a life that people can trust. Right. I want to live a life of faithfulness and consistency. That when people saw me in 2015 and they see me today, then I'm the same. Right. I want to live a pattern that people know. If I say that it's right, then they know that I put some things into it and I'm not wishy-washy. Right. But we've got to be consistent. Abraham was consistent. He was not perfect, but he was consistent. If we read further on in Genesis chapter 12, you'll see where Abraham lied and he gave in to fear. So Abraham was not a perfect man. We're not here talking about perfection. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. None of us are perfect, but we can be consistent. Yes. We can be real. Yeah. We can be authentic. And that's what we need to do. And so Abraham goes on this journey. He goes through Canaan. And in verse 6 it says, As Abraham passed through the land unto uh, to Sikkim and to the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed, what seed? I don't have any kids yet. Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who had appeared unto him. And he removed thence unto a mountain on the east, of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed, going on still southward. Verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. How great. You decide to live for God. You decide to be obedient. You decide to step out. And there's a famine. It's kind of hard to back God's word up to your family when you leave and you take it to a drought. Uh -huh. 
It's easy if you say, come on, we're going to go follow up to the Lord. We're going to go do this. And then the milk and honey flow and everything is good and everything is right. But when you say, we're going to go do this, and then all of a sudden the trials hit. And the, the blessings stop flowing. Instead of having plenty, now you're scrounging around looking for what you're going to eat next. To the point where Abraham linked himself up with some people, and he ended up having to lie because he went into Egypt, and Sarah was a beautiful woman, and he was afraid that they would kill him and take her. So he came up with this plan, tell them you're my wife. It was a half-truth. A half-truth is still a lie. Everybody should have said amen on that. A half-truth is still a lie. True. But he said, tell them you're my sister. She was his half-sister. But he said, tell them you're my sister. Don't tell them you're my wife because they'll kill me. And so they went in, they deceived the Egyptians, and, and the Lord took care of that. And, and, and God, you know, came to Abraham's defense. He sent plagues on Egypt. But, church, what I want us to understand is what we have today is because of one man's obedience, one man's covenant. The things that we have in our Bible today, many of them were established with Abraham. Right. And the challenge that I want to give us is that we can establish things in our family because of our faith and our obedience. Mm. We can establish a covenant for our children that God will say, you know what? Because Sister Patty served me, I'm going to bless Gabe's children. I'm going to bless his grandchildren. God is a, a God that honors relation. How many times did he declare himself, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yeah. He's a relational God. Yeah. He's a God that sticks to his covenant. He's a God that remembered how things started. We are laying up treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt. And someday when my grandchildren need the Lord, if the Lord tarries and we're not called out of here, and my grandchildren are in a crisis and they need God to move. I want God to be able to say, I remember when Brent Wedding made a vow to me. When he yeah. served me and it wasn't yeah. easy. When yeah. he stuck it out and he wanted to quit. When he stood when nobody else was standing. And because he served me, I'm going to remember the prayers that he prayed. I'm going to remember the talks that we had. And the promises that I gave to him. And I'm going to bless his grandchildren. See, I believe that we can pray and we can plead the blood over our families and our future generations and we can make some covenants with God that will extend to our children and grandchildren. Now, they got to serve God for themselves. Right. they got to get the Holy Ghost for themselves. My kids can't go to heaven just because I'm going. Right. But God can show kindness to them because of my walk. That's the kind of relationship I want to live. Right. I've been studying the prayer of Jabez, and, and one of the things that the prayer of Jabez prays and, and declares <laughs> is that the land will be blessed because of me. Uh -huh. Solomon prayed that for the temple. And when I pray for our church, I have a whole list of things that I pray about. But one of the things that I pray about this church, not just me and my family, but about you and this church as a body, I pray, God, let Peru be blessed because of Apostolic Chapel. Right. Right. Let the businesses of Peru be blessed. Let the schools of Peru be blessed. Let the families of Peru be blessed. Let Miami County be blessed because of Apostolic Chapel. Let the state of Indiana be blessed because of Apostolic Chapel. Because there's a group of people that call on the name of the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. We have got to start understanding the power of our walk with God. That's right. right. That's you right. can walk with God in such a way that right. people are blessed because of you. Uh -huh. That's right. The Lord told Abraham, I will bless them and bless thee. And curse them and curse thee. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed because of you. Do you know you can have such a walk with God that if somebody blesses you, God said, Ooh, they just blessed him. I'm going to bless them because they blessed him. I've 
seen it done. Yeah, me too. I've yeah. seen people pour out blessings. Yeah. We had someone bless our family. We're nothing, but we had someone bless our family. And I watched God give them an unexpected, just mind-boggling amount of money. All because they chose to bless us. Mm -hmm. Money that they had no idea was coming to them. And the Lord just opened it up and gave it to them. Because if you have a relationship with God, mm -hmm. he said, I'll bless them that bless thee and I'll curse them that curse thee. All right. We don't have to seek vengeance because the Lord said, if they touch you, I'm going to take care of it. Yeah. Right. If they curse you, they're going to be cursed. If they bless you, they're going to be blessed. But we got to be obedient. Yeah. It was all contingent on trusting God and being obedient to Him. Mm -hmm. But how great is it to think that your walk with God can affect what happens around you? At different times, I've, I've talked to Brother Rudy about the negotiations that go on at Chrysler and all the different things. And I've told him more than once, and I've told it to different people. God can work those negotiations out because of you. Right. Because God wants to bless you. Because God wants to take care of you. He will bless everybody in that factory if he has to, to bless you. Right. right. Yeah. We need to understand what faith does. Faith blesses all those that are around us. God will bless everybody around us so he can bless us. People that work with us, they ought to be honored that they work with us. Really? Yeah. I believe God will give the whole factory a, a bonus just so he can give you a bonus. It's biblical. We've got to understand obedience moves God. Faith moves God. You won't be obedient if you don't have faith. We talk about Abraham in the Old Testament being a covenant of law, and it is. But before there ever was a law, Abraham had faith. He had faith. There was no law given. Abraham had a covenant of faith. His covenant was not a covenant of the law. His covenant was a covenant of faith. And that's what we need is a covenant of faith. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, I want to talk just a little bit about some of the blessings that God said he was going to give to the nation of Israel. Because the nation of Israel, they are the descendants of Abraham. In Deuteronomy 28... It says that it shall come to pass in verse 1. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God and to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. It all comes from obedience. It all comes from a response to the Lord. And it might be something simple. It might be the Lord speaking to you, telling you you need to repent. You need to be baptized. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. That's a step of faith. That's a, a step of obedience. When the Lord is dealing with us and, and he says, you know what? You need, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And you say, whoa, where'd that come from? That's the Lord dealing with you. That's the word of the Lord coming to you. When that, that still small voice comes to you and says, step out of your pew and go to the altar and pray. You see, we always think the voice of God is going to tell us to do something big. But if God can't whisper in your ear to run the aisles, how can he whisper in your ear to move to a whole new land? Right. Right. Jesus said, once you're faithful in the little things, then he'll make you ruler over many things. Our covenant starts with obedience. Our promise starts with obedience. He said, all these blessings will come upon thee and overtake thee. How many times do we spend our time praying, oh, God bless me. God, I need a check in the mail. God, I need you to put some money in my bank account. 
down and got poured it on. He opened up the windows of heaven and blessed me. And we're seeking a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear me? We're seeking a blessing. The Bible said that the blessing shall come upon thee and overtake thee. If we will just trust God at his word and live obediently, you won't have to seek the blessing. The blessing will seek you. What did Solomon pray? Lord, when he was praying to bless the temple, he said, I, I pray that you forgive our sins, heal our land, that you hear the cry. And what did the Lord respond back in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. You know why he said seek my face? Because if we seek his hands, we're seeking what he can do for us. How, well, how can you bless me? How can you work a miracle? How can you straighten this situation out? He said, seek my face. He didn't say, you know, worship at my feet, seek my feet to see where I can take you. Seek my hands to see what I can do for you. He said, seek my face, desire to know me. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God is the Holy Ghost, being right with God, seeking to know God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. You know what he was saying? If you seek me, I'll take care of the things. The Lord told King David, he said, if my blessing would not have been enough, all you would have had to do was ask, and I would have, I love this because the Bible says I would have given you such and such. Yeah. You may not even know what you want yet, but I'll give it to you. Yeah. If you put me first. Too many times we seek the blessing when we should be seeking him. If we'll walk in obedience, the blessing will overtake us. He said, Doubt, you'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the field. I'm going to bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and increase thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. I'm going to bless the basket and the story. I'm going to bless what you do. You're going to be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. God will take care of your enemies right in front of your face and you won't even have to fight the battle. He said they're going to come before you one way, and they're going to flee. They're going to run seven different ways. They might come as a unified army, but when the Lord steps in, they're going to scatter. And they're going to run from you. We spend a lot of our life trying to provide for ourselves and take care of our situations and fight our battles and get the blessing and get ahead in life. We work overtime and we get second jobs and we, we do things to try to get ahead in life. Now, we've got to be wise and we've got to be responsible, but can I tell you that if you want to get ahead in life, obey God. Right. Trust his word. If you'll do that, God will take care of everything else. Yes, he will. We had a new carpet put in today. The crew that came and did it, they were Hispanic, and, and then the guy who spoke in English, he saw my ties hanging on the wall in our bedroom, and he said, are you a pastor? Yeah? He said, oh, you're a rich man. I said, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. He said, if you have God, you are rich. Mm -hmm. It's true. Right. That's true. Even he got it. Yeah. He said, if you have God, you are rich. Yeah. If we will seek him, if we will trust him, he will bless us. We won't have to spend all of our energy and our time trying to get ahead. The Lord will work it out. Yeah. I do not stand before you as a man that thinks I have it all together. If we had a couple hours, I would tell you my faults and failures. <laughs> I'd name them one by one. All right. <laughs> But in my life, I have tried 
to obey God. I've tried to be submitted to the Word of God. I've tried to take the advice of my pastor and the men of God in my life. I've tried to be obedient to the Holy Ghost. When he says give, I try to give. When he says go, I try to go. When he says stay, I try to stay. And God has blessed me. What I'm trying to tell you is you might wonder, how do I change my life? How do I change my situation? How do I get from where I'm at to where I want to be? It comes by trusting the voice of God. Yeah. If you want to change in your life, it's not about fighting for a better job or overtime or working or getting a loan or buying a new car or a new house or trying to add to your stature, but it's by seeking God and obeying Him. Jesus is the answer for a better life. Amen. Deuteronomy 28, 8 said, The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto do, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God will command the blessing to come upon you. Man, I don't know why y'all are shouting. Come on. God is going to command a blessing to come upon you. Yeah. Yeah. The blessing will have no choice. It will have no option. He's going to command the blessing. Whatever you do will be blessed. Yeah. All right. The problem is sometimes when the blessing comes, we don't realize it because blessing also brings responsibility. The more you're blessed, the more you have to take care of. Amen. Brother Ruby, Sister Kim. <laughs> the more you're blessed, the more you have to take care of. Yeah, we're talking about the chickens. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> blessing brings responsibility. Sometimes we don't recognize the blessing because of the responsibility that comes with it. And so God gives us a blessing, and we got to work a little more than what we're used to. And so we're focusing on the extra work and responsibility. We don't realize, oh, Lord, you blessed me. Yeah. I have to change the oil in my car and put new tires on my car. Why? Because God blessed me with the car. All right. I got to mow the lawn. Why? Because God blessed me with the house. I got to fix the furnace. Why? Because God gave me heat. Sometimes blessing brings responsibility, and so we don't view it as a blessing. We view it as a chore, but it's a blessing. Yeah. What you despise taking care of, other people would love to have. That's right. right. And so we don't always see it as a blessing. I'm not talking to you today about driving Rolls Royces and Mercedes Benz and <laughs> Lamborghinis. That's all nice, and God can do it. But I think it's very shallow if we think that God's blessing is limited to wealth. Yeah. Now, if God wants to give you a Rolls Royce, take me for a ride. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I'm not here preaching that you're always going to have $100,000 in your bank account, but you could. Because he said, I'll bless you in the storehouse, and all that you do will be blessed. But I'm not here preaching a prosperity gospel, although I believe God wants us to be prosperous. But what I'm telling you is there is a peace that passes all understanding. I know people that have a million dollars in their bank account. I know them. They're in my family, and they have no peace. Yeah. They need to watch this lesson. You need to rewind that part about if you bless me, God will bless you. Yeah. But I know people. In my family, they have a million dollars in their bank account, and they're not happy. Yeah. That's why I don't limit God's blessings to money, because you might have money. Right. You might have that half a million dollar house, but you don't have any peace because you don't have God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it all starts with following Him. Who wants to bless their children? Who wants to bless their grandchildren? I do. Right. How does it start? Abraham, if you'll listen, yeah. I'll bless you. If you'll obey, I'll bless you. Church, we are missing out on blessing yeah. because we're not catching the voice. 
we got to listen for the voice. Abraham heard the voice of God and he obeyed it and he was blessed. What I want us to think about is what has God been speaking to you? Has God been telling you to give a Bible study to your neighbor? Has God been telling you just to invite your neighbor to church? Maybe the Lord's told you to, I don't know, mow the church lawn. Give $10 to a missionary. It doesn't have to be some big grand thing, but the blessing will be grand. It just it blows my mind because it was something so simple. But for two weeks, God kept dealing with me to get the baptismal tank clean and filled and ready. And I put it off for two weeks. And in passing, I told Sister Patty, I said, we were standing over here after service. I said, I'm going to come and clean out the tank and get it filled up. And she looked at me. Funny, you know, like somebody getting baptized or whatever, and said, you know, God just didn't be over me about it. And, and she said, two weeks ago, I almost came and told you that the Lord impressed upon my heart you need to get the baptism tank ready. About the same time he started getting with me. We filled it up. You guys know I have shared it, but we filled it up. And, said, and then the very next week, they shut us down. And I'm going, God. Now, what you tell me to get that tank ready for if we can't even have church? Still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I did it. And I would come every few days and I would make sure that the water hadn't gone down and I would treat it and make sure that it was, you know, being sanitized and all that. And in the middle of a shutdown, we baptized two people. Yeah. It wasn't 200, but we baptized two. Yeah. One was filled with the Holy Ghost. Because someone heard the voice of God and responded. Right. It might seem little, and you might think, well, it's just little, so it doesn't really matter. It's the little things. Yeah. The little things. Maybe God's dealing with you, and it seems like it's insignificant, and so your disobedience doesn't seem like it's a big deal. And so you think it's okay to ignore that thought that keeps coming to you. But if God lays it on your heart, it's a big deal. Yeah. We need to learn to trust that voice. We need to learn to trust God. And if we will bless him, if we will be obedient, he will bless us. Yeah. In Deuteronomy 28, 9, he said, Then the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he had sworn unto thee, and thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Verse 10. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. Not in a way that you know, oh, he's a big bad giant. Right. But you can have such a relationship with God that people know better than to mess with you. You can have such a relationship with God that people look at you and they say, don't mess with them. They're blessed. Whatever they do works out, so don't mess with them. I want to live in such a way that all people of the earth know that I belong to him. And that the blessing of God is recognized in my life and that other people are blessed because of me. Right. And it goes on. I mean, there's verses we can read. It talks about that um, you'll give and not borrow. He'll make you the head and not the tail. I, I tell the Lord all the time, make me rich, I'll give it away. Try me, Lord, try me. But he said, you'll be able to give and not borrow. He'll make you the head and not the tail. Church, it's all about trust and obedience. As we stand tonight, I want to challenge you. Don't overlook the small things. If God leads you to go pray for somebody, go pray with them. When you're obedient in that, then the Lord will try it with something bigger. Oh, they wouldn't pray for that person when I prompt them. Now I'm going to prompt them to do something a little more. And guess what? As your level of obedience grows, so does your level of blessing. Yeah. 
Your faith grows and the blessing grows. No matter where you're at tonight, you can start listening to the voice of God. Maybe God's been talking to you for years and leading you for years and, and you recognize that voice. Great, keep going. But maybe you've never heard the voice of God speak to you. Sometimes it starts when we hear the word of the Lord preached. Mm -hmm. It's not because the man or the woman behind this pulpit is an angel or God. But when they declare the word of God, yeah. it's God speaking to you. So when you hear that person say you need to repent, listen to the voice of God. When you hear that person say you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus to have your sins washed away, listen to that voice. As you hear that voice and you obey that voice, God will begin to lead you into other things. Yeah. The Bible says his spirit will lead you and guide you into all the truth. So no matter where you're at tonight, what is God telling you to do? Start where you're at and move forward. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the promise of blessing. We thank you for the promise that if we trust you and if we obey you, you will claim us as your own and you will bless us and you will take care of us. Lord, you will bless others around us. Our walk with, with you does not just affect us, but it affects our families, our jobs, our work, our, our, our communities. It's important, God. People are counting on us to hear you and to follow you. Help us, God. You said your sheep hear your voice. Help us open our ears and our hearts. Help us to hear you and obey you. And Lord, let us see the goodness of God in this generation. I thank you and I praise you. Lord, give us the courage to trust you. Maybe we're bound by fear. Give us the courage and the faith to trust you and to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.